Good evening, and thank you all for joining us um, here at Wolfenson Hall. We were just commenting on how getting used to being in real life is something unfamiliar and new to us, and uh, we're very happy to be here in person. We're also joined by a number of people online, including two of our panelists. So this is a hybrid event, um, and we're, as I say, really happy to be getting back into the uh, swing of doing things in person. I'm Suzanne Akbari, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's panel titled The Uses and Abuses of History, Responding to the War in Ukraine. I'm grateful to my colleagues, Anglos Kaniotis and Patrick Geary, who co-organized this event, and also to those who assisted in the practical arrangements, especially Joshua Horowitz, Dario Mastriani, Melissa Morton, Susan Olson, Julianne Robinson, and Maria Mercedes Tuya. It's our hope that this evening's presentation and discussion will help each of us to have a fuller understanding of the ways in which the historical past is mobilized to serve political ends and of the responsibilities that each of us bears in conducting those conversations in an ethical way. In thinking of the uses and abuses of history, we aim to come to a deeper understanding of how historical accounts of the past are used strategically to affect decision-making in the present as well as possible future developments. Tonight, we'll be focusing specifically on the war in Ukraine and the suffering of those directly affected by it. At the same time, however, we may also wish to reflect on the uses and abuses of history in other contexts, and perhaps opportunities may arise for future panels in a series. In that light, before saying a few words to begin tonight's conversation, I'd like to pause by asking each of you, both in person and online, to reflect on the land you currently live and work on. For those of us gathered here physically on the IIS campus in Wolfenson Hall, this takes the form of reflecting on the layered history of this land. The Institute uh, for Advanced Study is situated on land that is the ancestral homeland of the Lunapewak, or Lenape people, who were displaced by violent colonial actions that forced their relocation to the north and west. These peoples include five federally recognized communities, two located in Canada and three in the US. The Muncie Delaware Nation and the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, both in Ontario, the Stockbridge Muncie Community Band of Mohican Indians in Wisconsin, and the Delaware Tribe of Indians and the Delaware Nation of Lenin Lenape, both in Oklahoma. State recognized tribes in New Jersey include the Ramapo Muncie Lenape Nation, the Nanticoke Lenin Lenape Tribal Nation, and the Powhatan Lenape Nation. Members of the IAS community are developing relationships with some of these Lenape nations and tribes, including a collaborative history research project with Muncie Delaware Nation members, along with archivist Caitlin Rizzo and Dr. Melissa Morton, as well as archival research in partnership with Princeton University Libraries. More information on this work, both historical research and relationship building, is available on the webpage of the Historical Studies and Social Science Library, and I'd like to thank Marcia Tucker for her work on that. Before introducing our panelists, I'd like to introduce the topic briefly. As you know, both authoritative and popular voices have called upon the lessons of history to justify military actions in Ukraine, as well as to argue against them. Tonight we ask, what is the role of history and the role of historians in this political conversation whose painful human impact continues to increase day by day? Our panel of experts, representing a range of historical specializations from antiquity to the present day, will consider how the study of the past can inform our understanding of current events and also point the way toward possible futures. First, a few housekeeping announcements. We'll begin by hearing from our four panelists, two joining us online and two present in the room. We'll then have a round of discussion among the panelists before turning to questions from the audience and more discussion. Those of you joining us online can see on your screen that we've shared, and we'll share again later during the discussion period, links to two web pages. These will appear in the chat um, where you could copy them if you want them. First, the School of Historical Studies resource, resource page on the war in Ukraine, compiled by Miles Jackson, which includes publications by members of the IAS community, as well as other historical and archival resources, as well as places you might like to contribute. Second, you'll find the IIS webpage for contributions where the drop-down menu includes a prompt for Scholars at Risk, which is a fund specifically to support those directly affected by the war. Finally, for those joining online, please feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time. For those here in person, I'll invite you to pose your questions to the panelists directly during the discussion period. We'll plan to go for about 90 minutes this evening with a little flexibility if the conversation requires it. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists in the order that they'll speak. Patrick Geary, above at right, is Professor of Medieval History Emeritus at the Institute for Advanced Study and Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at UCLA. For over a quarter century, he has served as the recurrent visiting faculty member of the Central European University. He is the author of some 15 books and many articles and edited volumes on European history. 
These address a broad range of cultural and social issues with a concentration on transformations of European society and antiquity and the early Middle Ages, and on ideological uses of ancient and medieval history in the 19th through the 21st centuries. Kim Lane Shepley, at left, is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Princeton University. She taught comparative constitutional law in Ukraine in the 1990s and worked as a researcher at the Russian Constitutional Court in the 2000s. She writes about the rule of law, constitutional transformation, and the rise and fall of democracy, particularly in Eastern Europe. She is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the International Academy of Comparative Law. Alice Isabella Sullivan, uh, on the screen at left, is Assistant Professor of Medieval Art and Architecture at Tufts University, specializing in the artistic production of Eastern Europe and the Byzantine Slavic cultural spheres. She has award-winning publications in peer-reviewed journals such as Art Bulletin and Speculum, and is co-editor of two volumes, Byzantium and Eastern European Visual Culture in the Late Middle Ages, and Eclecticism in Late Medieval Visual Culture at the Crossroads of the Latin, Greek, and Slavic traditions. She's also co-founder of the North of Byzantium project and Mapping Eastern Europe, two initiatives that explore the medieval history, art, and culture of the northern frontiers of the Byzantine Empire in Eastern Europe. Finally, Angelos Haniotis, at right, is since 2010 Professor of Ancient History and Classics at the Institute for Advanced Study. His research is dedicated to emotion, historical memory, religion, theatricality and public life, and society in the Hellenistic world and the Roman East. His recent books include War in the Hellenistic World, A Social and Cultural History, Theatricality and Public Life in the Hellenistic Age, and Age of Conquests, The Greek World from Alexander to Hadrian. He currently serves in the Council of Higher Education in Greece. And so with that, let me please introduce uh, Patrick Geary to be our first panelist. Suzanne, thank you very much. And I appreciate this opportunity to return to the Institute, at least virtually. Uh, I, I regret that the reason for this is this tragedy that is unfolding uh, every moment in Ukraine. Western military experts have been perplexed that the initial phases of the Russian invasion have followed not 21st century strategic or tactical doctrine, but rather one from the middle of the 20th century. The ideological justification of the invasion, as presented in an article under the name of one Vladimir Putin published in July of 2021, is even more archaic, repeating as it does 19th century myths about nation and people, the type of myths that contributed to the catastrophic wars of the late 19th and first half of the 20th century and that have been revived since eight, 1989 by ethnic nationalist ideologues across Europe. Putin's article entitled, quote, on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, and I have submitted a, on a, the URL, should anyone wish to read this piece, argues that, quote, to have a better understanding of the present and look into the future, we need to turn to history, unquote. But Putin's or his ghostwriter's understanding of history is right out of 19th century romantic nationalist ideology, which posits peoples as eternal unified linguistic, cultural, and political units, having their unchanging national character and identity. These peoples, whose origins were typically traced to the early Middle Ages, inhabited their sacred fatherland at that time, which would forever define their territorial rights their friends and their enemies. No previous polities, population movements, or cultural political changes were legitimate, and no subsequent historical change invalidated these claims. As Putin writes, quote, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are all descendants of ancient Rus, which was the largest state in Europe, end of quote. He goes on to say that they were bound together by a common language and a common orthodox faith since the baptism of Vladimir in 988. The rest of his article describes the disintegration of ancient Rus, Rus and its suffering, quote, until Moscow became the center of reunification, continuing the tradition of ancient Russian statehood. Moscow princes, the descendants of Prince Alexander Nevsky, cast off the foreign yoke and began gathering the Russian lands, end of quote. 
throughout his telling of this long and tortuous history was a struggle against Western powers, primarily the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and then the Habsburgs, who sought to perpetuate the division of Malorussia and to introduce Roman Christianity. He does pay lip service to the idea that, quote, some part of a people in the process of its development, influenced by a number of reasons and historical circumstances, can become aware of itself as a separate nation at a certain moment. However, ultimately, he concludes, quote, I am confident that the true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. Our spiritual, human, and civilizational ties form for centuries and have their origin in the same sources. They have been hardened by common trials, achievements, and victories. Our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation. It is in the hearts and the memory of the people living in modern Russian Ukraine, in the blood ties that unite millions of our families. Together we have always been and will be many times stronger and more successful for we are one people." End of quote. One could easily deconstruct Putin's version of history, beginning with his failure to recognize that the Rus, including Vladimir or Valdemar, were actually Norse, not Slavic, and that the language which he terms Old Russian is better termed Old East Slavic, since Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian all represent later dialectical divisions, and that the populations of what would become Ukraine included not only Slavs, but Tartars, Cossacks, Jews, Greek, and Armenian communities, Lithuanians, Hungarians, Romani, and Poles. Indeed, some well-meaning defenders of Ukrainian sovereignty, themselves obsessed with this kind of 19th century romantic ideology, do just that, attempting to construct a similar historical argument to demonstrate the contrary that Ukraine and the Ukrainian people have always existed apart from Russia and Russia's. However, I think that to attempt to argue on a basis of history, the legitimate rights of Ukraine to nationhood would be to fall in the same error as that committed by Putin in his historical justification for denying the separate identity of Ukraine and Ukrainians. This is exactly the kind of argumentation that developed in the course of the 19th century and that continues to haunt much of Europe until today. Prior to the last decades of the 18th century, sense of belonging to a people was but one and not the most necessarily significant form of social identification. It certainly did not carry any necessary claims to political independence or legitimacy. Religion, kindred, lordship, region, legal status, social stratum provided the most of the overlapping ways by which politically active elites identified themselves and organized for political action. Certainly, national linguistic or ethnic identity did not unite lords and peasants into some common sense of belonging. Beginning in the Renaissance, some intellectual elites, particularly in Germany, began to look to the past and see in resistance to Roman imperialism, a common source of identity. And the rediscovery of the Roman historian Tacitus Germania was fundamental to this process. However, this common history and cultural identity did not imply political identity, which continued to be understood in terms of lordship, kingdom, empire. The politicization of strategies of identification really took place within the political context of the French Revolution and especially the Napoleonic Wars. During these wars, as the French Empire expanded at the expense of the Rhineland principalities, the Habsburg Empire, Prussia, and beyond, both some Prussian ministers, such as the Freiherr von Stein, and more significantly British agents hoping to open a second Vendée, sought to generate opposition to Napoleon by inculcating a sense of popular solidarity against the occupying French. This meant mobilizing and politicizing the elements of earlier cultural nationalist feeling. The German intellectuals enlisted in this effort, most notably Johann Gottlieb Fichte, evoke very much the same tropes of unity as does Putin today. 
the importance of a common language, whether or not the German dialects did in fact constitute a common language, and a common history of self-defense against the alien. The fiery rhetoric of Fichte and others began the process of connecting cultural identity to political identity, suggesting that by nature of its cultural and linguistic identity, the German people likewise merited sovereignty and thus should oppose French rule. Such claims were initially rejected, in fact, by the rulers in Prussia, Russia, and the Habsburg empires, precisely because they were multicultural polities whose foundations had nothing to do with ethnic identity or cultural solidarity. In fact, the new French empire unwittingly contributed to the development of a discourse of ethnic polities. French carved out conquered regions such as the former Habsburg and Venetian empires. They carved out semi-autonomous regions such as the province of Illyria, which encompassed portions of what is today Slovenia, Italy, and Austria. Along with introducing French language administration, the occupiers also encouraged a new national self-identification to unite these regions in order to break their ties with their former rulers. These movements after the defeat of Napoleon gave rise to new national movements in the regions. And thus long after the Napoleonic period, the successful mobilization of the nation's twin disciplines of scientific history and philology as a foundation of new national consciousness became a formula for the aspirations of ethnic nationalists across Europe. Historians sought the origins of Europe's nations of the earliest records that documented the names of peoples. In some cases, such as that of Greece, this matter returned to antiquity. But for most of Western and Central Europe, it led to the so-called migration period and the early Middle Ages, as we have seen in Putin's evocation of the baptism in the 10th century. Thus, the French saw their origins of their nation with the Franks and the baptism of the first presumably French king Clovis in the early sixth century, exactly like Putin's uh, evocation of baptism. The English looked at the arrival of Anglo-Saxons and Jutes. Uh, Spain revived its Visigothic past. Hungary celebrated the arrival of Magyars and so forth. Indo-European uh, philology made it possible to project these nations seen as cultural, linguistic, and social unities even further into the deep past. Uh, philologists constructed deep histories of languages with the assumption that common speech also implied a common culture, identity, and right of independence. Foundation of early medieval kingdoms was interpreted as a creation once and for all of these homelands of peoples and implied their right to political and cultural autonomy. Fundamental to this ideology was that it was scientific and inescapable. One was born with an ethnic identity which was fixed and determined. And the goal of intellectuals was to reveal to the people this identity and to awaken in them the recognition that the identity necessarily implied the need to liberate people from outside dominance. But of course, the reality was that it was impossible to draw geographical boundaries of states so broadly that they would include all of the members of a given ethnic group, while at the same time being sufficiently narrow so as to exclude those who did not identify or were not identified with this group. Ethnic boundaries have never coincided with geographical boundaries, and thus the mission of the state became the task of homogenizing identity either through a massive public, public education that includes the suppression of minority languages, which we have seen going on in Ukraine, uh, but also in Russia, uh, or else the exclusion or expulsion of those not identified with the nation. It could also mean, as today, wars to, quote, recover those portions of the people that had somehow been lost to the motherland, but who by virtue of their language, culture, and deep history were eternally part of it. Precisely this is the ideological program of Vladimir Putin, as it was in the Franco-Prussian War to recover Alsace and Lorraine in 1870. At that time, the great German historian and nationalist, Theodor Mommsen, 
and a series of essays justified the, justified the conquest of these regions because their population was Germanic and their language German. The response of the French historian Fustel de Collonges directly challenged this dominant ethnic nationalist ideology and is still in the 21st century, I think, worth remembering. Fustel de Collonges said, neither race nor language make a nation. Men feel in their hearts that they are one people when they have a community of ideas, of interests, of affections, of memories and hopes. And do you know what makes Alsace France? It was not Louis XIV, it was our revolution of 1789. From this moment, Alsace has followed all of our destinies and has lived our life. All that we think, it thinks. All that we feel, it feels. It has shared our victories and our defeats, our glory and our faults, all of our joys and all of our sadnesses. It has nothing to do with you, for it is the country is France. The foreigner is Germany. One might apply this in a different way to the situation in Ukraine. Neither the baptism of Vladimir, nor the long entwined history of Ukraine and Russia, nor supposed ling linguistic similarities justify the political conquest and absorption of a sovereign state, just as an equally constructed idea of eternal difference does not justify the independence of a Ukraine. What does? On December 1st, 1991, over 82% of the electorate went to the polls to determine whether Ukraine should exist as an independent state, and over 90% voted that it should. This is what matters, just as does the willingness of the present population to defend this new state with all its force and with their lives. As a professional historian, I'm convinced that so-called arguments from history are usually false and self-serving. History, after all, is not the recovery of some moment frozen in time, some essence to be found in the past, but rather the study of change, differential change in human societies across time. The study of history can, I think, nevertheless, help us avoid the fatal errors of the first half of the 20th century. It would be well for Russia, Ukraine, and other European nations to discard these toxic ideas of outmoded ethnic nationalism in favor of recognizing the proven capacity of modern nation states to integrate a multiplicity of ethnic, national, and religious groups. In effect, they must recognize the difference between the past and the present. Thank you. Um, Kim, can I invite you to go next? Yeah, so. so you can hear me? And the other of which is to share my screen so you can see my slides. So let me do that. All right, so now you can see. Okay, um, I'm going to try to do this with two hands, one with a microphone, one with the iPad. So um, first of all, I'm really glad to follow Patrick. And in case you haven't read his wonderful book called The Myth of Nations, there's a longer version of that argument there. And I urge you all to read his book. Um, as he's just told you, the connection of an ethnic group with a territory, with a language, is a kind of romantic vision from the 19th century. But my, miss my mission here is to take up the 20th century challenge, <clears throat> and to look at sort of what's behind some of what Putin claims to be doing in Russia, and particularly the claim that he is, quote, denazifying Ukraine. So first things first, obviously, the fact that the war is going on is why we're here. But this is something that's been going on a long time, the tension between Russia and Ukraine. And I'm going to start by showing you some maps. <clears throat> Not that maps are the whole story, as, as we've learned, the connection between peoples and territories is a contingent thing. But if you saw a map of Europe in 1900, one of the most obvious things is that many countries that you now take for granted aren't there. You know, one of them is Ukraine, another one is Poland. Most of what is now East Central Europe is simply not there. Because the, the turn of the 20th century was still the age of empires. 
in which Russia and the, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, still really dominated what we now think of as, as Eastern Europe. Now, World War I uh, began to change all of that. And this is a map that shows you, that green line shows you where the, the, um, the central powers moved forward into what was then Russian territory. And what you'll see, because you'll recognize some of the cities now, of course, is that the, the German and Austro-Hungarian powers pushed forward into what is now contemporary Ukraine. Now, as you know, the First World War um, it was brutal, it was terrible, but it also was a cover for a lot of other things, one of which was the Russian Revolution. Once the Russian Revolution occurred, uh, Vladimir Lenin decided that uh, he had a lot on his hands. So one of the things that he did was to sign the um, Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, um, which basically ceded all the territory that the Central Powers had acquired in wartime to the Central Powers, mostly just to stop the war, because he had enough just trying to manage the revolution. So because of this treaty, what happened was that you, what you now see is Ukraine suddenly became independent of the Russian Empire. It wasn't completely independent. It was still under the tutelage of the central powers, but there was a declaration of independence of modern Ukraine. And this is a point that contemporary Ukrainians look back on as the birth of the Ukrainian state. It didn't last long because as soon as the war was over, uh, Russia, now the Soviet Union, reclaimed it in 2019. So Ukrainian independence really lasted for all of one year. Now, if you look just one year ahead from there to 1920, and you look at a map of Europe, what you'll suddenly see is that there are lots of other states, right? So Poland emerges, Hungary emerges as an independent country, Czechoslovakia, it's, you know, and so on. So what you see, though, is that Ukraine is not there. And so what happened? So at the end of the First World War, as the three great empires were carved up, the pieces that were in the Austro-Hungarian Empire got the principle that, as Patrick said, was the romantic nationalist dream of the 19th century, which was to try to affiliate one people with one territory. I might add, since we're in Princeton, that that was a project that Woodrow Wilson was hearted, you know, wholeheartedly behind and the segregationism that Woodrow Wilson practiced here in the United States, he extended to the U.S. involvement in the carving up, particularly of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There are actually even um, descriptions of Wilson standing over a map trying to figure out where to draw the boundary between you know, Romania and, and Hungary, depending on where the ethnic groups were all located. So segregationists came to that part of the world, too. It's part of the same vision. Anyway, what you see from all of this is, of course, that Ukraine did not emerge as a sovereign state out of all of this. And so um, those who had gotten used to in the one short year um, in, of Ukrainian independence were sorely disappointed. And a nationalist movement was created within Ukraine to try to restore Ukrainian independence. Now, even after um, Ukraine was reabsorbed uh, back into what was then the Soviet Union, the territory of Ukraine was still quite unstable. So if you look at this map, the blue was the part that actually emerged in 1922 as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, part of the federated entity of the Soviet Union. But in the Second World War, a lot of conquered territories, as the borders were once again contested, got annexed to Ukraine. So Polish territory in yellow was annexed to Ukraine in 1939. Romanian territory here in orange was annexed in 1940. What was here called Czechoslovakian territory, but which had previously been part of Austro-Hungary, was annexed to Ukraine in 1945. That little snake island, which has now become famous, that you've all now heard about, is that little dot out there, annexed in 2014, and, and 2000, 1948, sorry. And then in 1954, famously, the Ukrainian um, general secretary of the Communist Party, Mr. Khrushchev, then gave Crimea from Russia to Ukraine. So all of the borders of Ukraine have been contested until extremely recently. Um, but the, what that's done is it's turned Ukraine into exactly what Patrick advocates, which is a multi-ethnic and multilingual state. 
And this is a map that shows you some of the legacy of that. So the, the green areas are areas where Ukrainian is, this is just by language, okay? So because ethnicities are of course all mixed once there's intermarriage and everything else, but the dominant language of Ukrainian is spoken in the green regions, Russian in the red regions, but you've got all around the borders, um, Romanian, Hungarian, Polish, and even what is there called the Belarusian language, which is rather a modern creation. So Ukraine has been a multi-ethnic, multilingual state. Um, and this you know, configuration dates to the rather accidental, although I must say welcome by Ukrainians, independence of Ukraine in 1991. Because when the Soviet Union fell apart, suddenly Ukraine became an independent state. But it became an independent state in a kind of unplanned way, which is to say, nobody knew it was gonna fall apart in 1991. And so suddenly there's an independent Ukraine and the question is, who are they? And this is where I'm gonna take up the story of Putin's claim to denazify Ukraine, the history of that, the multiple histories of that and what is triggering Russia in the present. Okay, so back to the period between the two world wars when there were actually nationalist movements really occurring all over this region in Ukraine, which is still, again, had been reabsorbed into the Soviet Union, this figure, Stepan Bandera, became a kind of leader of something called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. It was founded, obviously, as an underground organization in 1929, and it had rather extreme views. So here's just a couple of quotes from some of its publications. So on nationalism, and one of their official publications says, Ukrainians are those who are the blood of our blood, the bone of our bone, only Ukrainians have the right to Ukrainian lands, Ukrainian names, and Ukrainian ideas. And this group was also famously against the pluralism of contemporary Ukraine, particularly in its uh, intense anti-Semitism. So here's a quote from one of their 1929, you know, initial pamphlets. How to deal with the Jews? We have over 2 million of them in Ukraine. Nobody wants them. Everybody is only happy to get rid of them. So with this movement, the, the quest for, again, a new independent Ukraine was born. Now, Bandera himself is a controversial figure, and what's striking about all of these histories is how many of them there are. Okay? So contemporary nationalists who think Bandera is the founder of the modern nationalist movement always point out that he was actually arrested in 1941 and was under German detention until 1943. So he can't be responsible for some of the most horrific things his movement did. Others say, just read all the stuff that he wrote and everybody else wrote, and you'll see that the blueprint is there. So the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists uh, wound up spinning off a kind of military organization, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, known as the UPA. The UPA was delighted when Germany invaded Poland. And in fact, they moved to this German-dominated area of Poland where they received military training from the Nazi army. And they proceeded to engage in what we would now call ethnic cleansing of the parts of Ukraine that they were in, in Western Ukraine. They massacred lots of Poles and they especially went after Jews. They borrowed the tactics of the Nazi army and they were actively engaged in the Holocaust. Because remember, they were the ones who said that there should be no ethnic minorities on the territory of Ukraine. They declared independent statehood in 1941, and this is the, their act of, on the renewal of Ukrainian statehood. This rather alarmed Hitler and the Germans. They had not counted on this, actually. And so as a response to this declaration of Ukrainian independence, this is what got Bandera arrested and put under German detention because the worry that the Germans had was that this would get out of hand and take them out of their control. But as the war turned and as it became increasingly evident that the Soviet Union was going to win this one and reincorporate a non-independent Ukraine, the OAN engaged in what we would now call disinformation or fake news. So even before the war was over, it turns out that they started putting out these these pamphlets that said, the Holocaust, we had nothing to do with it. It's all the Germans and actually some Poles, okay? And they also created and this thing called the Book of Facts, in which they created a series of documents meant to look like originals that were backdated to show that the organization had been nothing but committed to pluralism and the glory of the Soviet Union all along, 
right? And they forwarded this book, you know, as the, as the record of what they had done during the war. Um, and, you know, this is the history. This book of facts became distributed in the diaspora after the war. And so when everybody, when, when there are people who now accuse the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and or their military wing of having been perpetrators of the Holocaust, which I think every historian who looks at actual records would agree on, the Ukrainian diaspora says, no, no, no. They were nationalists committed to the pluralism of modern Ukraine. Because after all, here's this book with all of these documents. Now, if you grew up in Russia or in the Soviet Union or in any of what used to be called the satellite states, the history you read of this period was the history that the, that the OUN and the UPA were murderous genocidaires. Okay. Um, and that's the history that I think is still taught in Russia. Um, if you grow up in Ukraine, however, you get the other version, right? So for those advocating Ukrainian independence, the OUN are considered patriotic nationalists. And so since Ukrainian independence, what you've seen are lots and lots of statues of Bandera being put up of lots of, in fact, there's now a national holiday in his honor. Um, and he's become really a hero of the nation. In 2006, the Ukrainian government at that time under the culture ministry created something called the Institute of National Memory, um, headed by someone who was very much dedicated to the memory of Stephen Bandera, this guy Vyatrovich, um, who has presided over the rewriting of Ukrainian historical textbooks to reflect the book of facts version of what the OUN was about, rather than what Holocaust historians would say the OUN was about. Can you wait till I'm, I'm done? Okay, thank you. Um, and so what happens now in this part of the world, and in fact, it's not just on this point, but many points, depending on which country you grow up in, you get different obvious versions of what the history was of that time. Now, do Ukrainians still support this vision? And, and here the answer is absolutely not, actually. It turns out if you look at election results, um, the successor party that sort of, you know, uh, is the carrier of OUN sort of ideology into the present is one party, there's several of them, but one's called Svoboda. And if you look at the results of parliamentary elections from 2012, what you'll see is Svoboda, at the height of this reconstruction of Ukrainian nationalism, got 10% of the vote. It turns out that's the most they've ever had. Um, but what you may recall is, of course, that there were these protests in 2014 um, when, when um, the pro-Russian uh, president of Ukraine turned his back on an agreement with the EU and many people came out to the streets waving EU flags, which are, you know, wonderfully enough, the same color as the Ukrainian flag. But also in this crowd, there were the Svoboda, this far-right group, and also a group called Pravi Sektor. They were a small number in this group, but they were there. And when they show up with their flags and their images, it triggers to Russians that, oh my God, here they go again, right? Even though they're a very tiny part of this group. And so Svoboda and Right Sector were, you know, in the parliament with tiny numbers. Um, and they, they had what looks like this ethnic nationalist platform that sort of echoes what the OUN had, had uh, promoted. They were, you know, they had these Bandera flags with his picture on it. Um, and of course, as you know, Maidan, the protest ended in a violent crackdown. Um, there was a rapid change of government. I'm gonna go through some slides really quickly. Happy to share slides with you later if you wanna study them. Um, so there was a change of government. Yanukovych fled. There was a new provisional government that went into effect. And this is the slide I wanted to get to, which was the interim government formed in 2014 had in it a number of members of cabinet who were from the Svoboda and Pravi sector factions way out of proportion to their numbers in the parliament. And they were given ministries that triggered the Russians, okay? So they were the deputy prime minister, the prosecutor general. So that's like the, you know, the guy who's in charge of figuring out who to prosecute. Um, the education minister, namely who's in charge of the textbooks, agricultural ecology, head of the national security council and the deputy minister of national security. All those offices in the interim government in 2014 went to people from these far right nationalist parties. This was, I think, one of the, along with the fact that what this government did, the interim government did, this is the distribution of languages again in Ukraine, 
there had been protection for having official languages in different parts of the country that reflected the ethnic group or the language group that was dominant. But one of the first things this provisional government did was to propose to make Ukrainian the single official language of state. And when you look at the dates, when Russia seized Crimea, it was exactly in the dates when the law was adopted at, before the interim president was finally convinced to veto the law. It's exactly in that two week period that Crimea was annexed. Because again, Russia's looking at this, seeing all these people that they think are associated with the OUN in the provisional government, waving the Bandera flags with all the symbols. And Russia says, we got to grab our, our military base. All right, what else? So of course, as you know, fighting then breaks out in the Donbass region. And there is this battalion, it's come to be known as the Azov Battalion, which recruited far right devotees from all over Europe. Um, who came to fight the Russians in um, eastern Ukraine. And there were many foreign fighters with neo-Nazi backgrounds. This is actually an ad that I found online. If you wanted to contribute or show up, you could give money to this unit. And it, it actually has these kind of neo-Nazi symbols on it. There were thousands of people who apparently came from all over Europe to join this battalion. And the Ukrainian military, which was in terrible shape, was sort of grateful for the fighters. And so what they did was they incorporated this battalion into their National Guard. Again, another sort of trigger for the Russians. The Azov Battalion then spun off a political party. This guy, Andrei Biletsky, actually was elected to the parliament in 2014. They formed this new National Corps party. They would have all these rallies and marches. In 2018, Azov decided that it would go around the country and rid it of LGBTQ people, feminists, and Roma. And they had these kind of, you know, can reminds you of the Klan. If you, for the Americans in the room, it you know triggers certain memories. They were out and about, very visible. Okay, and so it turns out, however, that they had very little support. So this is these are numbers from the first decade after independence, but it, it's carried on since then. If you look at the percentage of people in these different countries, I don't know if you can see the bottom, but. The, the Ukrainians are the second from the right in the percentage of the public that supports far-right parties. The Ukrainians were far less willing to support far-right parties than were countries like the ones from left to right are Romania, Latvia, Slovakia, Poland, Slovenia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Estonia, all had more than 5% support for far-right parties, not so in Ukraine. So there's all this visible demonstration, right? There are all of these people who are out there triggering things, but they're not representing very much. And so then what happens? After Maidan, the support for the far right parties goes down. So Svoboda gets only 6% of the vote. They had 10% in 2012, 6% in 2009. By 2019, which is the election that brings Zelensky to power and I'm almost done, um, it turns out no member of a far right party gets elected to the Ukrainian parliament, which is to say comprehensively rejected by the Ukrainian people. And so what the Ukrainian people do is they elect a Jewish Russian speaker um, who actually wins, and you can look back here, he's the Green Party. He wins over 70% of the seats in the parliament. It's a complete repudiation of these far right views. Right? And so what we are now seeing is of course, you know, that the Russian army has since invaded claiming it's going to denazify Ukraine, which has already been denazified, right? That said, Mariupol, right? Today is the day when, when Putin announced that they're not going to just simply destroy it. But why is Russia going after Mariupol? That's the location of the Azov Battalion, which is still there and which has still flown the flags, shown the symbols, done all of these things that are to Russians what flying a, a Confederate flag is in the US to many of us, right? It's a trigger. And so when Putin talks about denazifying Ukraine, what he's responding to is this history he grew up on, right? Which is that the OUN is full of, I mean, as they were, <laughs> full of fascists. But the contemporary nationalist movement has really rejected all of that. There's no sign that this is what the Ukrainian people want. And so the war continues. And Putin, as Patrick said, 
is in is in the grips of some past that doesn't exist in the present. And that's why, you know, it's not the end yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. So thank you, Suzanne, for organizing this event and for the invitation to participate. And thank you to the other speakers and to the audience members for joining this important conversation. The current war in Ukraine is destroying human life and endangering monuments and the cultural heritage of the region, which for long have been intertwined and reframed in order to, to accentuate certain viewpoints and historical narratives. Russia is not the heir of the medieval polity of Kievan Rus, yet there have been ongoing efforts to delegitimize and transform the medieval cultural heritage of this region, parts of which cover the territory of modern Ukraine, in order to meet desired ends. Important medieval buildings of Kiev, as well as smaller and portable objects like icons, have changed forms and meanings over time, complicating the historical picture. My brief remarks today touch on these three important cultural objects here on the screen. The visual culture of medieval Kievan Rus has been appropriated as part of a Russian visual and ideological identity at the expense of other histories. This is evident with the Cathedral of San Sofia in the historic center of Kiev, built by Yaroslav the Wise during the, the first decades of the, of the 11th century. His father, Prince uh, Vladimir of Voldemir, the Great adopted Eastern or Orthodox Christianity in 988, initiating a process of Christianization in the region, which contributed to the design and construction of numerous places of worship. The Cathedral of San Sofia in Kyiv was chief among them. And I'm showing you here on the screen on the left, a modern view on the top and a reconstruction of the original edifice in the lower portion. Situated in the heart of Ukraine's capital, the Cathedral of San Sofia was inspired by Byzantine church building and decorating conventions, and was likely also erected with assistance from Byzantine masons and artists. The church was built using the recessed brick technique, characteristic of monumental projects in Constantinople. But it was not just in the materials and the methods of construction that this important edifice recalled Byzantine church building traditions. The layout and the rich mosaic decorations of the interior expressed Byzantine ideas as well. In this regard, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, now Istanbul, served as a key source of inspiration. We know that when the ambassadors of, of Prince Voldemar attended the liturgy in the great church in the Byzantine capital, they recounted, quote, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, for on earth there's no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss how to describe it. We know only that God dwells there among men, and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations, for we cannot forget that beauty." End quote. The architecture, decorations, and rituals of both churches, um, the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople and the San Sophia in Kiev, thus enhanced the sanctity of the spaces, leaving remarkable impressions upon those who experienced them. The interior decorations of San Sophia in Kiev contributed to the awe-inspiring experience. The lower sections of the walls preserve marble revetments and later mural paintings, while the upper sections display vibrant mosaics with Christological, Mariological, and hagiographical content. Most notably, the apse shows a monumental image of the Virgin Oranta and a detailed representation of the communion of the apostles below. As a liturgical interpretation of the Last Supper, this image type shows a double figure of Christ at the central altar, administering the Eucharistic bread and wine to the apostles arranged in two groups of six to either side, situated in the middle level of the apse decoration, and thus above the height of the original Templon. The mosaic of the communion of the apostles was meant to visualize for the faithful and the newly converted Christians assembled in the naos, the activities unfolding at the altar. The mosaic of the communion in San Sofia and Kiev is one of the earliest still extant examples of this iconography preserved in mosaic form. The Cathedral of San Sofia was built on a cross and square core surrounded by barrel vaulted aisles with galleries and a wider outer aisle with a tripartite apse and additional chapels facing east. But the Byzantine inspired layout is here transformed in order to create an impressive setting and accommodate a large number of the faithful. The exterior originally displayed a pyramidal arrangement, as you can see in this reconstruction drawing, culminating with the main dome over the naos, 
Intricately designed and monumental in scale, the cathedral was meant to impress and inspire while prominently marking the city skyline of medieval Kyiv. But the original appearance of the cathedral is hidden now underneath later restorations that have transformed the profile of the building. The most significant changes occurred during the 17th century when the lateral upper stories and towers were erected, eclipsing the original pyramidal composition of the church. These new visual forms, including the so-called paradomes, which have been associated with Ukrainian Baroque architecture, are directly tied to a Russian visual rhetoric for which the, multi the multi-tower facades with bulbous domes in various configurations became a staple. The current exterior plaster has also transformed the original appearance of the building, offering very different impressions upon which modern perceptions have been based. And it's likely that the exterior of the original structure was plastered and possibly also painted. The visual transformations of San Sofia altered the exterior appearance of the edifice, as well as its meanings and visual associations with Byzantium, aligning the monument instead with a visual vocabulary connected primarily with a Russian cultural milieu. Similar transformations in meanings and associations are evident in icons. One key example is the so-called Virgin of Vladimir, which is a bilateral icon of the Virgin Eloisa, or the Virgin of Tenderness, holding the Christ child. Likely of a Byzantine origin, based on its technique and iconography, the icon is supposedly also a miracle working image, having protected Moscow from military attacks during the 14th and 15th centuries, for instance. The icon arrived in Kyiv likely as a diplomatic gift from Constantinople during the third or fourth decade of the 12th century. Then later it was transferred to Vladimir, hence its name, and then to Moscow in the 14th century corresponding thus to the transfer of political power and its concentration on the Kremlin during the later part of the Middle Ages. In the 17th century, the icon also received, the front of the icon also received an elaborate revetment, which further transformed the appearance of this, of this icon. Other icons from Kyiv and other Ruthian centers like Novgorod had similar fates and are preserved today in the state Tetrakov Gallery in Moscow. These are icons of Russian origin, not Russian per se. Their layered histories, intimately intertwined with those of Kievan Rus, are, are bypassed now in favor of a more monolithic view of history and of a Christian history in particular. One final and brief example is the icon known as Our Lady Senskaya, or the mother of the god of the Kiev Caves, one of the oldest monasteries in the region. Flanking the Virgin and, and Child and thrown at the center of the composition are, are Saints Theodosius and Anthony. Scholarship hails them as the first Russian saints when they are in fact saints of early Rus, whose identities have been appropriated and transformed over time. The particular and in this case Russian reframing of the history and visual culture of early Kievan Rus has broader implica implications for the study of medieval Eastern Europe, which has long been relegated to the margins of scholarly inquiry. This marginalization of the diverse people, rich visual culture and complex histories of the Balkan Peninsula, the Carpathian Mountains and further north have been the result of geographical and temporal limitations within various fields of study, including history and art history, 20th century politics, including the presence of the Iron Curtain, which created actual and ideological barriers to the study of these regions, local ideologies and nationalistic narratives, the multitude of languages spoken and the languages of the primary texts, which are not easily accessible outside local scholarly circles, as well as inconsistencies in definitions of what constitutes Eastern Europe. And these maps show in one mode the shifting internal borders of Eastern Europe from the mid 14th century onward. Um, but now that um, times are changing and we are increasingly acknowledging the urgency to explore the history, art and culture of medieval Eastern Europe through connections, identifying elements of local specificity and negotiations among competing traditions and worldviews. The territories that make up Eastern Europe, including medieval Kievan Rus, developed at the crossroads and our culturally derived senses of classification and importance do not map neatly onto this material. Or inversely, this material does not fit neatly within the geographical 
temporal, methodological, and theoretical parameters established in medieval studies and Byzantine studies, for example. Eastern Europe, moreover, should not be dismissed as, or, or relegated to the so-called realm of the Slavs, quote unquote, in which only certain voices and perspectives are accentuated, ushering historical distortions. Uh, with this in mind, one of the aims of the North of Byzantium initiative, in the context of which my colleague Maria Leciarossi from the Index of Medieval Art at Princeton and I developed the Mapping Eastern Europe project, is to bring a multitude of voices and perspectives into the conversation. The aim is for this work to establish the study of medieval and Byzantine art in Eastern Europe on the maps of our respective disciplines, and especially on the map of art history given our research, as well as pave the way for future studies. And in this future work, it is crucial to examine the textual sources alongside the material evidence in order to counter modern myths and uncover the diverse and layered dimensions of the past. Thank you for your attention. And um, now can I ask Angelos to round out the panel? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you may know that the motto of the Institute for Advanced Study is uh, truth and beauty. Uh, represented by two uh, half-naked women. Uh, unfortunately, and this uh, motto is of course inspired by the mathematicians and natural scientists, where uh, beauty and uh, truth uh, often coincide, if not always. This is not the case in uh, historical studies and social sciences. Beauty may be very untrue and truth is not always beautiful. Uh, this brings me to the sad subject of today. The war in Ukraine has created a new expression, a new word, Putin Farstea, those who understand Putin. And those who understand and ultimately justify Putin's attack on Ukraine mainly operate with references to history. This was already explained by the previous speakers with the ethnic origin of the Ukrainian population, with the history of the region, with the support that some Ukrainians offered the German troops in World War II, with Soviet Union's spheres of influence, and allegedly with inherited rights of the Russian Federation to continue this tradition of having spheres of influence more than 30 years after the end of the Soviet Union. We have heard about this by previous speakers. In my short presentation, I will move the discussion on the use and abuse of history from the parties to the conflict, that is from the Russians and the Ukrainians, to us, to those who observe this conflict and comment on it. I will limit myself to three observations. When I visited Odessa, for a few days in 2010, I took a taxi. To my surprise, the taxi driver was Greek, originally from Sohumi, the ancient Greek colony of Dioscurias, now the capital of Abkhazia. He had left Sohumi in the 90s to escape the destructive war between Georgia and Abkhazia. In 1886, 22% of the population in Sohumi were Greeks. After a dramatic decline, after the revolution of 1917, still 6.5% of the population of Sohumi were ethnic Greeks in 1979, not Orthodox Greeks, but ethnic Greeks. But after the war, only 645 people were left less than 1%. In the war in Ukraine, the respective identities and national histories of Russians and Ukrainians, of course, monopolize the interest, and this is only natural. But the external observers of this war, of course, the previous speakers do not belong to this category because they have all uh, highlighted the diversity, the ethnic and linguistic diversity in this region. But sometimes the external observers of this war tend to overlook the fate of the many smaller ethnic and cultural communities that have lived in Ukraine for centuries and are now facing their extinction. Let us take, for instance, Mariupol. Before the beginning of the war, more than 4% of the population were Pontic Greeks. None are left. 
In some locations in Donetsk, the percentage of ethnic Greeks, not Orthodox Greeks, was as high as 20%. And the reason that they did not appear in the maps that you saw is that they are concentrated in uh, urban centers. They are not in the countryside. The Jewish communities have been affected in a similar way by previous wars and are also affected now. Since antiquity, the area of Eastern Ukraine has been multicultural with a large Jewish minority in the area of the so-called Bosporan Kingdom around the Azov Sea, with mixed marriages between Greeks and Iranians in cities such as Olbia and Hersonesos, today's Sevastopol, in the second and third century. There were Genovese settlers in Crimea and, of course, Tatar minorities settled since the time of the Tatar hands still survive in decreasing numbers. And of course, I could go on with other examples, including the Roma. These are only a few examples. And the book Imperial Odessa, written by Evridiki Sifneos here at the Institute for Advanced Study, when she was a member and published shortly after her untimely death, is very instructive precisely about this diversity of cultures. So my first point is that looking at the history of this region exclusively in terms of the respective histories and identities only of the Russians and the Ukrainians is an oversimplification and in this respect it is an abuse of historical sources and traditions. The second point. History is abused not only when it is based on falsifications or oversimplifications or inaccuracies. History is abused also when essential differences between the past and the present are not noticed. Some current discussions of this crisis by political scientists and historians alike, especially by the Putin first air, are conducted using ideas of the time of the Cold War and the divisions of sphere of influence that dominated Europe at that time. Unfortunately, such views do not take into consideration precisely history, that is, important historical differences. They do not constitute an abuse of history, but they constitute a partial and misleading use of history. And I'm not referring here to differences such as the nuclear weapons, which have been around for many decades. And I just remind you that the atom bomb was only used by a power that knew that the enemy could not retaliate. I am referring to other very significant differences between the then and the now, between the Cold War and the 21st century. Firstly, the countries that have broken free from the Soviet Union may have shown signs of corruption and the undermining of democratic institutions, Hungary, for instance, but their citizens have experienced three decades of freedom, independence, a democracy of sorts, and respect of human rights, and they are not prepared to become the collateral damage of geopolitical schemes once again. The unexpectedly fierce resistance of the Ukrainians is proof of this. Secondly, China has emerged as one of the world's strongest economies. And this is a big difference between the Cold War and now. Thirdly, and in my view, most importantly, because of climate change, humanity is today facing an existential threat that cannot be dealt with uh, out joint action by states. Future geopolitical changes in Europe will be dictated by nature. For instance, the Netherlands are going to disappear. Rising seas will wipe out islands and coastal areas. Melting ice will make accessible the treasures in the subsoil of hitherto inaccessible regions. Traditional food suppliers will be replaced by others. And in this context, Europe, and I am a European citizen, I think I'm the only European citizen among the speakers, Europe cannot play its leading role in meeting this challenge if it is a battleground with Russia, either on 
the sidelines or in the trenches. If history can be of some use, then not by urging us to return to 1980 or 1939 or 1914 or even earlier, but by reminding us that ideas that may seem today utopian may come true. The idea of Russia cooperating with the Western European democracies, democracies for a new order of security in Europe certainly seems today as unrealistic as the idea that France and Germany would cooperate to create the European Union would have seemed in 1945. And yet, just six years after the war, France and Germany jointly founded the European Coal and Steel Community, which laid the foundations for the European Union. As I recently wrote in an uh, opinion uh, article, Europe cannot afford new or such divisions. Europe needs Russia as a partner. Only the Russians need to understand that Russia does not need Putin and his circle in order to be a power with dignity. Looking at the past may be useful, but only when we do not forget to look at the big diff, the big differences. When I heard that Putin chose the expression essential operation instead of war, I was immediately reminded of the Roman practice of making a distinction between bella, wars, and expeditiones, expeditions. Only a few of their enemies were worthy of a bellum. The war, for instance, against African tribes or rebels was just an expedition, it wasn't a war. Similarly, Putin is degrading his opponents by not regarding them worthy of a war. However, to just take the Roman practice as an exact parallel would be wrong because this parallel is limited. By choosing the expression essential operation, Putin freed himself from the obligation to declare war and therefore to respect the Geneva Convention. I now come to my final third point. History, authentic, reconstructed or fabricated, triggers thoughts, presents explanations. It serves to explain the whys, but it does not necessarily reveal the what fors. So why is then the use and abuse of history so important as the previous speakers have shown? The Greek fable of the wolf and the lamb, based on relevant experiences antiquity, offers an explanation. I quote the version that one finds in the Greek poet Babrios in the second century AD. Once a wolf saw a lamb that had gone astray from the flock, but instead of rushing upon him to seize him by force, he tried to find a plausible complaint, enclema, by which to justify his hostility. Last year, small though you were, you slandered me. How could I last year? It's not yet a year since I was born. Well then, aren't you cropping this field which is mine? No, for I have not yet eaten any grass, nor have begun to graze. And have you drunk from the fountain which is mine to drink from? No, even yet my mother's breast provides me nourishment. Thereupon the wolf seized the lamb, and while eating it, he remarked, You are not going to rob the wolf of his dinner, even though you do find it easy to refute all my charges. We may be able to refute all of Putin's charges, but this will not reduce the bear's appetite to have its dinner. Historical traditions offer excuses, but they are also emotional enhancers. And this is my third point. They increase indignation. They increase hatred or courage, patriotism or pride. Collective or cultural memories however constructed, are emotional memories. Brain imaging has demonstrated the interdependence of attention, memory, emotion, and decision-making, or convictions, or values. For instance, when we visit the Washington Mall, the statues, for instance, of the Korean War or of Martin Luther King, they attract our attention. The images and the texts that accompany them bring back memories, and these memories trigger emotions, sorrow, 
pity, pride, fear, anger. And in this way, values, beliefs, attitudes are shaped. Exactly as memories trigger emotions and generate attitudes on an individual level, constructed so-called memories, they have nothing to do with memories, they are traditions, they are reconstructed history. Constructed memories, accurate or not, serve a similar function on a collective level. This is why we celebrate commemorative anniversaries. This is why we set up or destroy statues. In order to fully understand, therefore, the not the origins of the abuse of history or the of fake news for that matter, but the impact that the use and abuse of history has, we need to draw information and inspiration from this cooperation between historical studies and neurosciences. Thank you. Thank you, Angelos. Um, and thanks to all four of our panelists for their presentations, which have um, uh, 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 been incredibly rich. Um, what I'd like to do now, for those who are joining online, please don't hesitate to put questions or comments in the chat. We have a couple of comments that have come in already. Um, and before turning to questions from the audience, both online and in person, I wonder if the four panelists have any responses or comments that they'd like to offer to one another. Uh, Patrick, uh, Alice, Kim, or Angelos. Oh, oh, do you want to use your microphone? Um, well, uh, so we should, okay, sure. Um, I have a couple of comments that are in the chat and then I'm going to invite um, people from the, the audience. Um, there are a couple of comments. One is that I think was responding primarily to, to um, your presentation, Kim. She was saying, it's very important to point out that the term Nazi or fascist was widely used in the USSR to denigrate dissidents. It was a long-term Soviet strategy to attack dissident opposition to the Soviet system. And she mentions Marlene LaRuelle's um, book, Is Russia Fascist, in that um, context. I wonder if there was anything you want to comment on there, Kim? Yeah, just to say, yeah, so just to say that I, I'm in complete agreement. So, so this, this constant um, uh, sense that the Ukrainians were fascist. I mean, first of all, the OUN was not a gigantic movement, right? And there were many people in favor of Ukrainian independence who were not affiliated with the OUN. So what's, what's unfortunate about the present is the way in which the OUN's um, symbols, I mean, for example, this glory to Ukraine that you hear everybody shouting now was a slogan of the OUN, right? So, so that was a small radical movement. It doesn't mean everybody agreed with it. And there were all kinds of uses made of that in the Soviet time, which frankly, someone like Putin who grew up with those textbooks and that was the history that he learned as virtually everybody you know, who was educated during the Soviet time would know that history of Ukraine. When Ukraine does these things that trigger it, Ukrainians that use those symbols may have no idea where they came from or not understand exactly what they would be associated with. And it's exactly this clash of histories, this clash of memories um, that is generating you know, some of the conflict. So I agree that Nazi fascist is used constantly in reference to all Ukrainians by people who grew up in the Soviet Union. It doesn't mean that was true either, right? Mm -hmm. But it means that those symbols trigger something when Russians see them on TV, which of course Russian TV has been broadcasting like crazy. So that's what lends it plausibility now. Thank you, Kim. Um, another question that's come in from the chat is from uh, 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 Chris Krilova. Uh, a question that I think um, uh, Patrick Geary might want to address, but others may have comments as well. Um, uh, they ask, if much of European recent history can be visualized as redrawing of borders, how can this war, as any war, be justified from the perspective of those not directly involved in the conflict? Um, that is... Well, uh, Apparently, my video is turned off and I can't turn it back on. Is my uh, audio working? Your audio is fine, Patrick. Okay. Let's see if we can fix okay. the video. I, in terms of the question of what is the role of outsiders within these, these issues, uh, I think that uh, when one thinks about identity, we have to think about this as a three-part process. Uh, there is the question of the uh, 
Yeah, I still can't turn the video on, but apparently it's off. Uh, that how people identify themselves, and this is very, this is essential, this is important. In this case, uh, people living in what is Ukraine who identify themselves as Ukrainians. But then there's identification outside, which say uh, Putin who will identify these people not as Ukrainians, but as Russians or as Nazis. And then there is a question of whether a third others looking at both of these groups accept or reject these, these images. Uh, either the self-perceptive or the projected on this population. So I don't think it's a simple question of can people on the outside say who people are. Uh, this is a process by which a group identifies itself. This identity can change. It can be challenged. It can be destroyed. If Putin is successful, if he is able to practice what our president says is genocide and what is said by others to be genocide, then I suppose it's possible that Ukraine, that Ukrainians will not exist. Uh, if he is unsuccessful, one can hope that in time, the Ukrainian identity will be accepted by Russians as well as by others. And this goes back to Angulos's point that Europe needs Russia, Russia needs Europe, neither need Putin, but it, uh, one can hope that five years from this horrible time, uh, something akin to the early origins of the European Union might begin to bring Russia and Europe into uh, contact. The Putin understanders, on the other hand, who simply want to justify him, I think have no place at the table. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Angelos, did you want to add to yeah, that? Uh, I will add something uh, to this, which is uh, indirectly uh, connected with the question, but will bring me back to a very nice remark that uh, Patrick made at the beginning, that is the quotation of Isel de Coulange about what constitutes a nation. In his view, what constitutes a nation is not the language, but it is the shared experience, the French Revolution in, in that case. And uh, this brings me to uh, my point, which is the importance of values. The Europeans are not a nation because they do not share the same language, they don't share the same uh, constitution forms, they don't share the same religion, and so on and so forth. But the experience that they had in World War II has made them, in a sense, a nation, because this experience that some had as winners and some had as losers, made them understand simple values that are not shared by others. For instance, the fact that the Lebensraum, the vital space of a country, is confined to its borders, period. The fact that a country may exercise economic, political, or cultural influence, but not by means of military intervention. These are not values that are shared, for instance, necessarily by the United States, as we know from interventions in Latin America and Asia. Uh, the only European countries that have violated this principle are Turkey with the invasion of Cyprus 1974, the Soviet Union with the invasion uh, or intervention in uh, Hungary 1956, then Czechoslovakia in 1968, indirectly in Poland in 1980, and then 2014 uh, in uh, Crimea. So this is why I believe, and this brings me indirectly to the question of redefining borders and so on, that this is something that at this time unites those who oppose Russia. And this is something that the European populations have understood better than the political leaderships for the simple reason that these are values that have bon not been imposed on the European populations by some intellectuals or politicians, that these are values that have emerged through the struggles and the suffering of Europeans. Thank you, Angelos. I'd like to turn to the audience now for questions. And I think um, Josh has got a microphone, which he's going to bring down. Can you bring it here? Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you. Be good. Yes, yeah, th thank you very much. That's quite informative. Uh, one thing you clearly showed in your presentations is that 
that the the countries and the layout of the country significantly changed after a war. And so somehow a war was the catalyst for change and that whether it unified the countries in Europe or whether it established new independent countries or whatever, things got shuffled because of a war. But in the past, if we look at history in the past, we weren't as global then as we are now. I mean, we are very global now in terms of communications. I mean, we're communicating with people in Ukraine from this country and everything. I just wonder um, how that globalization might change what happens after this war. And I think you alluded to it when you said, well, we've got to fight you know, climate change and things like that together. Um, the other thing I would mention, this is just as an aside, after the USSR fell, I was hired, and I don't see this in the history books, I was hired as a consulting team from America to establish capitalism in Russia. And I traveled there with a team of about 30 Americans multiple times over a couple of years to establish capitalism. And when we met with the people, they all told me the same thing. We want to be like America. And then it didn't happen. I just wonder if there might be some resurgence of that kind of uh, desire by the people in Russia. Just, um, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, globalization is a new uh, uh, factor. And uh, actually, it confronted us even before uh, the realization of the consequences of uh, climate change in a more direct way with the pandemic, when we should have realized that there are no local solutions for global problems. And everyone was trying to solve, even if this is a, just a federal state in the United States, having a different policy from uh, the rest, everybody was uh, trying to address uh, such a global problem with local uh, measures. And uh, this is, in my view, the uh, essence of the challenges of the future, whether we are dealing with poverty in the underdeveloped or third world, or we are dealing with climate change, or we are dealing uh, with um, a pandemic, there, this requires international cooperation. This may sound utopian, but it doesn't change the reality that this is the only solution. And sometimes utopias are the solution to a problem, even if they are not realized. But in this case, from uh, especially what, uh, as far as uh, climate change goes, the uh, existence of the human race will depend on that. And I think that um, uh, it is not, again, it is movements of uh, population, popular movements and so on, that realize these problems. And this is, again, an experience that we make in history, that sometimes these movements may become influential. They may cause something like the French Revolution in 1789, not as a revolution, but as a rethinking of the way we behave. Thanks, Angelos. Um, did you want to add, Kim? So let me just say one thing, and it goes to the establishment of capitalism, which goes to what happened in 89-91. So in 1989, the countries of what we now think of as East Central Europe were given more autonomy than they even realized at the time, right? It was a slow realization that they actually could design their own, chart their own course again. And when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, out of it came a number of states some of which had never been independent states before, <laughs> and some of which had only been dreams of independent states, or some like Ukraine, which had only been a state in the modern sense for one year. Um, and so what we're seeing, I think now with this, with this war, and I might say in addition to the one that Angelos mentioned, there was also you know, the Russian invasion of Georgia and the fight in Abkhazia, and the, you know, so th there'd been a whole bunch of post-Soviet fights. And a lot of that was because there was a lot of the identity tensions, the identitarian tensions around a kind of vision of ethnic nationalism were tamped down in the Soviet Union. And so when suddenly that, you know, all of these peoples were liberated, essentially what happened was many of them reverted to these, these kind of images of nationalism from the 19th century. It was as if all that stuff in between hadn't really happened. People went back to the last time our country was you know, independent, or the last time our country was a country. So we're still seeing, I mean, 
it, it, we think of the French Revolution not as a year anymore. And we shouldn't think of the, the, of the end of the Cold War as a year anymore. This is all still part of that process of working out all of these identities and what they meant and how they came out from under, in a sense, a, a great project in the repression of all that stuff for many years. So, and I'm not sure this is the end. I mean, we still have Nagorno-Karabakh, Transdenistria is still, I mean, there's a number of unresolved conflicts that have to do with the rise of, of various forms of ethnic nationalism, um, which were created by the artificial way the boundaries were drawn within the Soviet Union. And Yugoslavia, of course, was another one, which, you know, fell apart. Czechoslovakia fell apart, right? So, I mean, if you just look over the, the number of new countries and the number of civil wars and the number of border disputes that are from within that Soviet region, I mean, this is, I mean, I don't mean to relativize what's happening. What's happening now is horrible and it's the biggest one of all of them. But it's part of that falling apart of the Soviet Union. So again, you know, it's like we have to reframe the end of the Cold War as being a multi-decade period and we're still in it. May I, oh. may I also add something briefly to that? Oh, please, to yeah, that? please. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, both of my colleagues' comments are, are very pertinent. I think that uh, one of the tragedies is that in 1989, 91, and beyond, as these new or emerging polities appeared, they looked to 19th century ideas of how to constitute themselves rather than to models of uh, pluralist uh, polities. And one of the great tragedies, and here I think historians are partly to blame, is that 19th century historians were very, very good at reaching a broad public. And we professional historians, with few exceptions, are not and people rejecting Soviet ideology turn to 19th century romantic histories to tell them who they were supposed to be. And these 19th century ideas, rather than the alternatives that have been discussed today, uh, took a very deep hold in these regions. Thank you, Patrick. As we're getting close to the end of our time, I wanted to share one last question that came from the online chat that I feel like picks up some of the threads that we've been already hearing a little bit earlier. Uh, this is from Talia Zajak, who says, in light of Putin's teleological version of history, many Ukrainians are calling for a, she says, decolonized approach to history of the region. One that recognizes, for instance, local multicultural histories and gives equal weight to multiple narratives. It would be great to hear thoughts on this. And, and we heard a little bit about this, um, Angelos, you brought this out a bit, but I wonder if any of the four of you would like to build out on what Talia's comment here. May I <laughs> go? Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I was um, I, I was jotting down that comment as well because it, it really touches on the importance of, of looking at history and its multi-layered and complex um, ways of, of operating, uh, both on a lo local level, but also in a networked context, and looking to the to the to the past past, to sort of look, going back to the 10th century and 11th century, um, Kievan Rus, um, identifying um, not just the connections with Byzantium as a um, as a center periphery dynamic or as a as an influence model, but rather as a local adaptation and translation of visual forms that aligned with a, a new Christian identity in this context. And then also how those forms were transformed over time. So looking at history and its various moments of transformations and trying to, uh, to, to, to get to a, um, to a clearer and more complex picture of how that fits into the current narrative or narratives. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, right. Would you like to add? I just have a very uh, short comment. Is the fact that um, uh, communities deal with such um, issues of diversity in their history when they feel safe, when they do not feel threatened. Mm 
Um, I am uh, Greek and uh, Greece was until <laughs> the uh, Second World War uh, really in many respects a multicultural uh, state with uh, Jews, with Armenians, with uh, Slavic minorities, with Vlachs, uh, with uh, Albanian speakers and so on and so forth. We are now ultimately recognizing and studying the existence of these smaller communities because the identity, so to say, of the uh, Greek state as such is not immediately threatened, at least, <laughs> or not <laughs> from uh, such uh, minorities. Mm -hmm. This is why I find it on the one hand extremely valuable because this is something that creates a new consciousness and a new uh, attitude but it is at the same time extremely difficult to happen in a period of conflict if i can just add one thing to that i mean one thing i remember because i was living in budapest at the time that the u.s bombed serbia um, and what i remember was that all of my liberal friends in belgrade became nationalists overnight and we're seeing the same in ukraine Right, which is to say, the good part about this from the standpoint of Ukraine's self-defense is that the loyalty of the Russian speakers in the East was not taken for granted until the war broke out. And I think Putin was counting on the loyalty of the Russian speakers in the East being at least open to revision. Uh, what we're now seeing is people digging in on a common Ukrainian identity, which on one hand is kind of inspiring, right? Because suddenly they're all fighting, the, the sacrifices they're making to preserve their independence is really extraordinary. But I think it means it's gonna take a long time for any kind of local, you know, sort of pluralism to come back again, because it will take a while before Ukraine is safe, exactly as Angelo said. But I wanted to suggest that maybe we should think not so much about recovering all the local identities, as something else, and, and my friend Anna Vesely is here in the audience, she just came from Budapest yesterday, and she was telling me about a couple of projects, I think one in Hungary, one in Romania, where scholars, historians from different countries in the region, who after all share common histories for all the reasons that you could see just in the, the maps were just state borders, but if you think about linguistic and like all the other ways that this region is all mixed, the, the idea of these historians is to create common history books for school kids in which everybody from every country in the region learns the same history. That's pulling in the opposite direction of localism. And what, unfortunately, this project has been going on for decades and it's nowhere close to actually reaching agreement, even among the professional historians. So one of the things I might say to all the professional historians here <laughs> is that this might also be a worthy project, right? As of thinking of how all these histories relate to each other, including the histories of each other's histories. You know, so in trying to figure out how to approach this topic today, one of the things I tried to tell you was, here's how the Russians have learned it, and here's how the Ukrainians have learned it. And once you have those kinds of things going on in textbooks in the region, it's very easy to start a war. And so maybe what we need is less localism and more of a common sense of the common history of the whole place. It's such an important point to end on, um, thinking about textbooks and the complicated discussions around them, just even in the US. It's a whole other conversation. Um, as we, before we thank our speakers, I just wanted to mention that um, we're in discussions to put on um, a couple of days of Ukrainian film and or documentaries um, for those of you who are on campus with casual discussion afterward for those who would like to do that. And again, um, uh, you'll see in the chat the, you, um, uh, a resource page um, on the war in Ukraine that the School of Historical Studies has posted. And we'll put that in the chat again. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here and also please join me in thanking our four speakers tonight. Thank you. Thank you.